Welcome to our continuing webinar series focused on creating a culture of caring and dealing with mental health issues and addiction issues and suicide. I'm Kevin Hilton, the CEO of Impact, and today we deal with suicide, a very difficult topic. And typically these webinars are limited to an hour, but today the subject matter just required a little more time. And I think after you watch it, you'll understand why. This webinar features Cal Byer. He needs no introduction. You've seen Cal on previous webinars. He's a subject matter expert, and we really appreciate him helping us through these very difficult issues and steering us in the right direction. And along with Cal, we have Brad Churchill, the CEO of US Erectors, and they're located in Des Moines, Iowa, one of our really great contractors that we have, we're fortunate to have. Before I turn it over to General President Dean, who's going to open this up, uh, unfortunately, Kevin Burns couldn't be with us today. Uh, he, he felt that uh, Eric would suffice. I have a few housekeeping items. First, we monitor the Q&A box only, as you, as you who have been on before already know. So you can enter your questions and answer. Uh, questions really will provide the answers, of presumably, we hope, live right, right, right now, if you wish. And we'll post the, this recording later on today or tomorrow on our website. The slides will be uploaded in that same spot, so you don't have to ask for the slides. We'll provide them for you. And after Cal and Brad's presentation, we'll have the Q&A session where they'll delve into the questions that you have. All questions are going to be answered either live or offline by Brad and Cal. So don't feel like you're typing into some black hole. And remember, use the Q&A function. And uh, before we welcome Cal and Brad, uh, I've asked uh, General President Dean. And uh, like I said, unfortunately, Kevin Burns, his chief of staff, won't appear today to introduce this very difficult topic. So thank you for tuning in. Eric? Uh, good afternoon out east. I uh, appreciate you taking the time for this important webinar. You know, recently I wrote an article about the alarming statistic about suicides in the construction industry. You know, we all take it personally when one of our members gets injured on a job site or God forbid there's a fatality. Then they came to find out we were suffering more fatalities from membership having issues either with dependency or God forbid even uh, mental health issues that cause a rash of suicides. After I wrote that article, I received an outpouring of support from both members, contractors, thanking me for putting the attention that we need to tend to our brothers and sisters needs. And not only as union members, but the contractors as their employees. And it, it's an injury to all of us when we suffer a loss such as this nature. In our business, we're such a culture of, we mind shop on the job, but we fail to take note of that personal stock in our members. Brad is gonna share a tragic story about the loss of his son, but it, it, it comes after folks like Sean Neely, our district council president in New England, shared his grips with dependency and helping members and getting on the path of recovery and noticing and more importantly, being there for our members. So I appreciate you taking the time today. I ask you to be hyper vigilant both on the job and off the job in making sure our brothers and sisters needs are being taken care of. Every local has an employee assistance program and if they don't, Impact provides a catch all one for our members because mental health is something that needs our attention and I appreciate all of you devoting a special interest in the well-being of our members from morning, noon, and night. Thank you, and thanks to Brad for his time and sharing the tragic loss of his son. Thank you. Thank you, General President Dean, for those very insightful words. And now I will introduce Cal Byer and Brad Churchill, A Father's Love. Thank you very much, Kevin. We appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. It's a really sensitive topic. It's a personal topic. It's a family topic. Today, we're going to discuss a personal story and a personal account of a suicide loss. We titled this program, A Father's Love. 
Lessons from a Suicide Loss Survivor. Thank you very much, Kevin and Kevin Burns, for introducing me to an IMPACT member named Brad Churchill. And uh, Brad is going to share a personal story of his grief journey, losing his son, Trevor, uh, almost four years ago. Good morning, Brad. Nice to see you today. Good morning, Cal. How are you? Doing really well. It's nice to, to be with you today. I wish under different circumstances, but thank you for taking time to, uh, to share your personal account. Sure. Thank you very much. And Kevin, thank you and everyone at IMPACT. I uh, definitely appreciate being here. I've enjoyed this series uh, starting this fall with in mental health and kind of from that really kind of felt the calling to um, give everyone my my story and hope you provide some insight um, as to what it's like to go through the loss of from suicide. Yeah, Brad, you and your family have very strong faith, a lot of strength and just a lot of grit to, uh, to be willing to share your story. So I know you're the CEO of US Erectors in uh, the Des Moines, Iowa area with a national footprint. And I work uh, nationally with the construction industry in this area of workforce risk and worker well-being. I work for a company called CSDZ and we're part of the Holmes Murphy. And as we discovered, uh, my parent company is based there in Des Moines as well. And it's a company that you know very well also. Mm -hmm. so. so what I'd like to do, Brad, is just cover kind of our learning objectives today. Um, yeah. Today, this is a really important topic. It's one that is very personal. And I wanna trust the audience that you'll understand that this sensitive topic demands that we discuss this very delicately. Uh, we're gonna trust that you'll understand that this is gonna be a mature conversation and it's not gonna be sensationalistic. It's gonna be really responsible. It's gonna use safe messaging and the safe depiction of suicide. Many people falsely believe that talking about suicide can lead people to consider suicide. And research has shown when we talk responsibly about suicide, it can decrease suicide risk. So today, Brad is gonna share what we call lived experience. It's a personal account of suicide. It could be a personal account like Sean Neely has previously shared, with substance misuse. But what lived experience stories do is promote help and they encourage help seeking, help accepting, and the focus on treatment and recovery. And in this case, this will be lived experience of suicide, overcoming grief, and having a new normal in Brad's life and also the life of his family. The second goal for today is Brad really wants to share methods to provide bereavement and grief support for survivors of suicide. Brad's gonna share some pretty personal accounts of how relationships seemed to change, maybe just perceptually, but how people didn't necessarily know how to communicate to his family. And he'd like to share some tips and some pointers, and these will be really good, useful techniques for everyone to consider adopting. And a third method is that method of providing support to suicide survivors, whether they're neighbors or coworkers, crewmates, friends, even neighbors, perhaps even strangers. There's a sensitivity and an empathy that we can build with understanding. And by sharing lived experience stories, these become very compelling. They're things that become memorable. We can learn these strategies to help make suicide uh, and the grieving process, a more normal conversation. It will reduce some of that awkwardness that people frequently describe when talking about mental health. And the fourth objective today is to really talk on a micro level about warning signs of suicide. And then fifth, Brad and I are gonna talk about how we can communicate to our loved ones about suicide and suicide prevention. So that will be our learning objectives for today. Just a quick note, I've said a few things about safe messaging and safe depiction of suicide. We put this content warning, but many people who have experience with suicide, whether it's suicidal ideations or have made an attempt or are survivors themselves, have developed suicide safety plans. And those individuals frequently will know that their plan will be contact your physician, visit an emergency room, 
or contacting established crisis hotlines like the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255 or the crisis text line at 741741. This is a very important message in terms of communicating suicide and the safe depiction of suicide. So some individuals could find this topic upsetting, but the purpose again is to focus on help and recovery by providing a hopeful message of recovery in this process. So Brad, you and I got to be pretty acquainted over the last uh, couple of months, and I really appreciate you sharing a lot of information about your family and that personal journey. When I looked at some of the pictures you provided, I was first struck by what a handsome family, uh, really an all-American family, that neighbor next door. It really showed us that suicide can affect anybody at any time. And uh, would you tell us a little bit about your family and tell us about the uh, circumstances of this photo, please? Sure, thank you. This photo was taken in the fall of 16, about six months before we had lost Trevor. Um, definitely, definitely glad that we had done it. Um, kind of, of my wife's encouragement. Um, our daughters were, our daughters and son were getting, were getting older. Um, our oldest daughter was already in college at the time and wanted to kind of create um, a memory, you know, for us all. It had been probably 10 years since we'd had a, a family picture, professional family picture taken. So um, took the opportunity to have it done and, and boy, we're sure glad we did. The picture was actually taken in downtown Des Moines. We'd done a few different settings, but um, this picture just really, really turned out well and, and we're glad to have it as a memory now. You want to tell us a little bit about your wife? You shared um, a pretty fun story about being high school sweethearts. I think people would probably enjoy that part of uh, your personality. Sure. Yep. Um, my wife, Tammy, um, her and I went to elementary school together, um, started dating. I believe I was 15. She was 14 at the time we started dating. Uh, went to college in different states, but stayed together the whole time. Um, and then we got married uh, right out of college after she graduated, uh, about a year about a year behind me. I graduated as a year older. And then I lived in Omaha for a, a short time. And Maddie, our oldest daughter, was born in Omaha and then moved back to Des Moines in 1998. And Trevor was born here in Des Moines as well as Ellie, our, our youngest daughter, was born here as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. And Brad, here's where the story takes that turn. The picture perfect family was shattered on May 8th, 2017. That's the day that uh, Trevor died by suicide. Can you share a little bit about the day you lost uh, your son, Trevor? Yes. We were just coming off of Mother's Day weekend. Um, Mother's Day was actually the, the, the day before his passing was on Sunday. Um, kind of a combination of Mother's Day. Uh, my father's birthday is in May. My birthday is in May. Our youngest daughter's birthday is in May. So kind of celebrated everything uh, that weekend. Everything was was usual, nothing, uh, definitely nothing out of the ordinary. Um, Monday morning, I had to take my daughter back to Missouri. My parents were with me. Um, just another Monday morning from, from all accounts that, that we knew. About four o'clock, my youngest daughter had sent me a series of texts um, saying that she, that she needed to get a hold of me immediately. Um, I had got a hold of her. I was a little bit, little bit busy at the time. I didn't get her text right away. Got back in touch with her. She said I needed to talk to mom immediately and talk to my wife. And my wife said that Trevor had passed away from suicide. Um, he had driven Ellie home from school, and like he does every, every single day, um, and then taken his own life when, when he got home. So um, unbelievable to try to deal with. Um, it was the longest, I was about five hours away from home at the time. Fortunately, my parents were with me, so they could actually drive me back home. Um, there's no way I could have ever made the drive by myself. I had Mandy, our oldest daughter, with me at the time, which was, was very nice to, to have her with. And then once kind of got home and um, extremely tough week, um, everything that we had to deal with to um, dealing with the police um, because it was was a death. I mean, they have to do an investigation. Dealing with the, the funeral home, 
um, finding a, a burial plot, writing his obituary. Um, everything was just really is a was a blur. Nothing you could ever prepare for. Um, nothing you. It's even hard to describe the experience yes. of going of going through all that, but it's just something that we had to we we had to do and do the best we could at the time and and really through support of of friends and family we're just able to make it through, through the week. Yeah, that's really um, amazing recollection. I think you probably never forget those details. And um, thank you for sharing uh, kind of those painful uh, circumstances. We put this picture up and uh, you told me this was um, a favorite uh, photo of Trevor as well. Do you want to just yeah. share a little bit about that uh, photo? Yep, that was his uh, sophomore picture from high school. Um, it had been taken in the fall um, and he was in a sophomore year uh, when he passed. So this is the last school picture that we have of him. Yeah, well, a handsome young man. You can see the smile, he's got a sparkle. We're gonna share other pictures uh, that really show uh, what appears to be a really happy person. And so Brad, I'd like you to share a little bit more about your son, Trevor. And sure. um, I'll share some of the montage photos that we put together. So again, thank you very much for sharing so many glimpses into your family's life and uh, particularly uh, Trevor's as well. Anything here that you'd like to highlight about uh, Trevor? Yeah, and, and Cal, thank you very much for um, doing this for me again. It was, it was fun for me to go through all the pictures, um, relive all the memories that, that we have with Trevor. Um, as, as a child, um, you can see from in all these photos, I mean, always smiling, always happy, um, enjoy being outside, enjoy doing things. Um, the picture in the, in the upper center was um, here at the amusement park, you know, excited to go on the, to ride the trucks, um, was a fan of, of baseball, you know, and just, I mean, really just kind of a, a, an all-American kid, you know, had friends, you know, grew up, you know, doing activities as a family together. Um, the lower center picture, uh, we spent a lot of time boating. Um, I was born, born and raised on a lake. Uh, my wife lived on a lake as well. So I was, you know, I was born around the, around the water. So it was important to us as a family. We spent a lot of time in the summer boating and here on Sailorville on the Mississippi River up on Lake Superior. So, yeah. and there's a lot of memories involved with that. Um, the picture in the lower right corner is Trevor and I in Hawaii. We had gone there when he was probably about 13 or 14 years old as a family and done a lot of hiking. And this picture was taken on the top of Cocoa Head Mountain. It was 1,014 stairs, if I recall right, straight up the, the side of a volcano. And Trevor, you know, did it like, you know, it was absolutely no problem. You know, the rest of the, the four of us were struggling to, to to make the climb. Trevor got about three quarters of the way up, realized he was thirsty, comes down probably a quarter of the way to meet us so he could get a drink of water, and then just took off like a shot and, and just trotted right to the top of it. So, I mean, that's just kind of kind of how he was. Yeah, that was a really great story. We kind of teased a little bit about him being like a mountain goat to be mm -hmm. able to do that. So thank you for sharing some of those. And we put some other uh, favorite childhood memories together also, and each one of these captured a certain part of his personality. That part yeah. was pretty obvious. Yeah, um, the, the, the picture on the left was actually his, I believe it was his 14th birthday, you know, just having, you know, uh, ice cream, you know, at the local Texas Roadhouse, went there for, you know, for dinner. Um, the, the top center picture, um, in school, uh, all the kids had to dress like a president, and he was Ronald Reagan. You know, gave a little, you know, 15 to 20 second speech, and you could ask him a question, and he'd answer a question and give you a, a handful of jelly beans. Um, the bottom picture is actually from Lake Superior, just up there in, enjoying a day on the lake with the family. The picture on the right is actually Trevor at a chill store, you know, riding a, riding a bike around the, around the store. You know, just, you know, I was kind of goofy like that, you know, love, have, love having fun and it just kind of fit his personality. Yeah, you could see some vibrancy in terms of uh, his personality and definitely has that glimmer in his eye in each one of those photos. Um, so a few more things 
really stuck out or stood out was his love of the outdoors. So many different dimensions that you shared about uh, your son and your family. Anything here you'd like to comment on or highlight? Yep. Um, I coached softball. I coached girls softball for about 11 years with our oldest daughters. Um, I coached my I coached my oldest daughter for four years, my youngest daughter for seven. Um, Trevor wasn't necessarily always big into team sports, but he loved sports, um, probably more on an individual basis. The two of us spent a lot of time going to, going skiing, hiking, um, trying to teach him how to play golf, and we just spent a lot of time together. Um, enjoyed going out west skiing up in the, up in the mountains. I remember one time we were at uh, skiing at Breckenridge, we had gotten. I think 14 inches of powder the previous day and it got straight up to the bowls, skiing down the, the backs of the bowls and probably, you know, back there, two, two plus feet of powder. Um, Trevor was in front of me, I was behind him and he just kind of just took a tumble. And for five minutes, we hunted around trying to find his skiing all the powder, you know, so he could make it back down the mountain, but finally found it. So, um, and that may be where the hot tub picture had come from too. You know, we'd sit in the hot tub after skiing, run out, especially in the in the powder, roll around in the powder, then hop back in the hop back in the hot tub. Um, the center picture is him in his boat. Um, we'll, I know you got some some later slides. Uh, yeah, that'll be fun that as well. So, thank you. Thanks for sharing some of those glimpses, and um, I really think this has um, been a really uh, telling experience you sharing uh, your story so openly and so boldly. These are the ways that we can normalize this conversation. And these were some of my favorite photos, being a huge hockey fan, grew up in Wisconsin. I got to spend uh, 12 years in Minnesota myself. And so that wild times refers to the Minnesota wild and their affiliate in your home state of Iowa. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, born, um, being born and raised in Minnesota, I think you just have to become a hockey fan. In school, we played a lot of pickup games on the lake, um, as anyone in Minnesota does, just kind of learns to play hockey from a young age and, and, and love the game. Trevor and I used to go to a lot of Minnesota Wild games. Their AHL affiliate, um, the Iowa Wild, is actually down here in Des Moines. So it's a lot, of, a lot of fun to see the kids, you know, develop down here in Des Moines and then go up and start playing um, in the NHL. Um, Trevor definitely enjoyed it. Got to go to a couple um, outdoor games. There was one up in Minnesota that we went to and went to a couple different Stanley Cup playoff games as well. So definitely enjoyed going to hockey. Yeah, just seeing uh, Lord Stanley's Cup put mm -hmm. a big smile on my face as well. So thank you for sharing those. Now, Brad, here is the only area where you and I kind of had a little uh, disagreement. I'm a lifelong Packer fan, but I'm going to pay uh, homage to a great uh, franchise, the Minnesota Vikings. But uh, I grew up uh, also enjoying the Cubs. Tell us a little bit here about your special affinity with both of those uh, teams. Sure. Yeah. Um, Trevor and I were fortunate enough to make a number of, of Vikings games. You know, um, again, he was, you know, he loved sports, you know, so, and that's kind of the, the time that he and I could spend together. You know, I coached, I coached my daughters, which took up a, a, a decent amount of time, and I always wanted to, to give the same time back to Trevor. So um, he and I, you know, found things that, that we could do. And a lot of it was all around sports. So love going up to Vikings on a you know on a Sunday you know Sunday morning, cruise up there, go to the game, come back. Um, and also here in Des Moines, we have the the uh, Iowa Cubs, which is an affiliate of the Chicago Cubs. Um, the Triple A ball club plays down here. So the the picture there is with Trevor Teagarden. Um, they're the catcher for uh, the Iowa Cubs for uh, quite some time. They had had a silent auction and we had won his jersey. So I now got to take a picture with him on the field. So um, just enjoy those special times. Well, the things that stood out when you shared all these photos was the time that you spent as a father and the closeness and how the family was always that central part. I think today in some of our photos, we focus more on you because you were the one telling the story, but it really the importance of a family spoke couple other parts of uh, Trevor's personality that I picked up from you is uh, his sense of humor and maybe even his sense of style. Um, I said, wow, you're from Iowa. Tell me how he took an interest in Powerboat. Well, then you shared all the trips to Lake Superior, you growing up on a lake. You told me about Tammy growing up on a lake. 
But uh, tell me a little bit about this boat, this power boat that he had. He enjoyed giving people rides in that, I recall you telling me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we had a, a larger boat, um, a Donzi power boat, not necessarily something you can give your kids and let them take out on the lake. So really, uh, all three kids had gotten their voter, voter card when they turned 12 so they could operate power boats legally in the States. So um, one year we got them uh, just a simple little 18-foot uh, Yamaha jet boat that they peeled around, a little CD jet boat that they peeled around in, um, kept it at the marina for them. They'd take their friends out. Trevor was always the driver. But uh, <clears throat> thought it would be kind of funny. Every boat has to have a name. And because this was the kid's boat, we actually called it student driver. So um, they, they got a kick out of it. They used that boat for a number of seasons, you know, take their friends tubing and just kind of go hang out, you know, and just kind of do their own thing, you know, away from the adults. And uh, he took both our daughters out a number of times, you know, out in their friends. Well, I think the par powerful part of that message was the safety message as well, how you instilled that message of safety with your children, much like you have your upcoming uh, annual eight-hour safety training day. That's one of the things you've talked about, um, uh, liking so much about impact and the mm -hmm. iron workers, the commitment around safety. But I thought that student driver was kind of a really cool story, and people would probably appreciate it as much as I did. Definitely yeah. uh, showed a great sense of humor. Now, here's where that story again turned sad. Brad, uh, the things that I just marvel that your strength and your faith is when you shared uh, the obituary and you asked if I would please read excerpts from that. So I'll do that right now. But you made it clear that that was something that you felt as father you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And um, this came about, um, you said, in that week um, after he passed and before the burial. But I think this is important. We saw a depiction of a really happy child who obviously had other underlying issues and we'll talk a little bit more about that but this was probably the first understanding uh, Brad that there might have been more beneath the surface right of what appeared to be a happy and uh, content and, and maybe well adjusted uh, young man so the obituary that you wrote started with a description of the family and then these are excerpts, more or less in the middle. But it reads, Tragically, he saw only mountains where we saw pebbles in the walk of life. We would give anything to hold him by the hand one more time and guide him down God's path. We loved him so very, very much. He was a great teammate, friend, peer, nephew, cousin, grandson, and brother. But most importantly, he was the best son we could ever ask for. And Brad, thank you for uh, sharing those words. One thing that was obvious to me, he knew he was loved by his family, each one of you. I wondered here if you wanted to share anything more, um, maybe about being caught by surprise. Any recollection, maybe with respect to... Um, hindsight, any changes in behaviors that may be warning signs or clues that maybe were overlooked or maybe didn't make sense until later? Sure. That could have helped you understand uh, what happened. As, as a child, um, he was always a little, a little quiet, a little shy to us. I mean, by no means alarming. But he also would get, you know, upset. You know, not necessarily upset where he would lash out, but you could just tell he'd get teary-eyed, he'd get emotional. Um, when he was kind of made the center of attention, when he had to do things he didn't, he didn't want to do, you could just kind of tell that, you know, there was something stirring inside of him. Um, he held his emotions back. Um, as he got older, he learned to, I think, cover them up. And, you know, we thought, well, maybe that's just, you know, part of, of growing up, growing older. He's, you know... It doesn't bother him as much anymore, but I think for him, the pain never went away. He just learned ways to cover it up and uh, really to kind of mask it from us. He did leave a note um, in his passing, you know, apologized, said, you know, we were great parents. But uh, the biggest thing that was that he said he just couldn't take the pain anymore. You know, and it's a pain that we didn't even realize he was going through. 
So, I mean, we just wish, you know, we'd give anything to go back and, and try Absolutely. to figure that, try to figure that out. You know, the prior sessions we've done in this series, we've talked about those very themes. Sometimes it could be stigma, that fear of the unknown, that desire of not wanting to um, admit that you're not doing okay, or knowing that you have a good family and a good upbringing, thinking that you can play through the pain or work through the pain and um, not wanting to be a burden on other family members. All of these are kind of those themes that we've been talking about. And a reason that you wanted to come forward and share your story was so other families would have that sensitivity to know that you can break through that stigma. You can shine that light. You can help that individual seek help and then accept help. And um, I think what was really obvious, and that's why we put this slide, Trevor also loved his family, not just that you loved him. And the fact that he had that sensitivity of, of thanking you for that, um, that is a gift that not every family receives is a, a suicide note. Some uh, studies would say maybe only 10 to 15% of those who die by suicide would leave a, a note. So I think you always kind of considered that um, maybe a blessing that, that you had that sense of closure, right? Yeah, um, definitely kind of gave us a little bit of insight to what he was thinking. We do know in talking with his friends, um, this was a planned event. We've learned quite a bit about, about suicide. A lot of people who are contemplating suicide, you know, will kind of go through, I mean, really almost a checklist. And one of the things that in, in talking with his friends was, was relatively common is the, the kind of preceding weeks, Trevor took time to spend with each one of them individually. You know, he and one friend had gone out to Sailorville, you know, and hung out for the afternoon. You know, and another buddy of his, you know, they had gone up, you know, and hung out at the top of a parking ramp in downtown Des Moines and, and had talked for a while. You know, and another friend, they had gone out for ice cream. Um, another one, they had gone out to the 50 yard line one night at the at the high school and, and kind of just sat there and talked about life. And for me, it was because it was Mother's Day, um, Saturday, it was our goal to clean the garage. And, and typically, you know, Trevor being a 16 year old boy, I'd have to drag him out of the house about a dozen times to get him to come back to work and, and finish the job. But for some reason that, that morning, you know, he stuck with it the whole time. He was eager to help, wanted to help, you know, get everything done. And I remember commenting to my wife that, you know, while wow, maybe he's, he's finally growing up. I didn't have to go drag him out of the house repeatedly. You know, he just really wanted to help and pitch in. And I think that was, was his way of spending time with me. Yeah, definitely can see why you would feel that way. And I think it was interesting how you shared that with Tammy also at that point. Now, as hard as this is, right, seeing these photos and sharing these stories and having all these memories of some happier times, rather than staying steeped in that sadness alone, you recognized as a father a responsibility to help your family overcome that grief, right? Mm -hmm. So you tackled your grief journey, and then your wife, Tammy, did the same, and then your two uh, daughters who also survived Trevor's um, death by suicide. So we thought it would be really healthy if you wouldn't mind sharing with us an update on your family. How's everyone doing? And sure. uh, just give us, uh, give us a glimpse of what life is like now, uh, moving through that unfortunate uh, tragedy to, uh, to the current state. Yep. Um, first of all, that picture um, was taken uh, this past fall. Um, our oldest daughter, Maddie, was a senior at Mizzou, and our youngest daughter is a senior in high school. And they actually had their senior pictures taken together. And I didn't know they were gonna do this, but uh, held a picture of Trevor, um, which is just, to me, probably one of the best pictures we have. But uh, as, far as, as far as my wife and I, um, it's, been, it's been a struggle. It's been a little over four years now um, since we lost Trevor. Um, there's not a day goes by that you don't think of it. You know, it doesn't impact your life in, in some respect. Everyone says, oh, it gets easier. You know, you'll be done grieving after a while, but that's not the case. It's something that, that you just, you know, live with. Um, your life is just dramatically changed forever. So it's still very hard for us to uh, celebrate, you know, his birthday, celebrate the day of his passing. Um, as a family, uh, we choose, like, a Christmas was always a special time for us as a family. And and now just the four of us will kind of just go out and and went to Arizona last year hiking. I think we're going to go to Hawaii um, this next upcoming year. But 
just to kind of get away and just to kind of get through Christmas um, without it really being Christmas anymore. Um, yeah. It's kind of one of the most difficult things to deal with. I think yeah. that's been a common uh, story, a common theme that many people have shared with me as well, developing a new tradition. And um, it's kind of avoidance, right? But it's also reality. You're, you're building that new, uh, that new reality. Yep. I thought this picture, um, boy, hit me right in the heart. Um, that was probably one of the more emotional pictures, just the sensitivity mm -hmm. your two daughters had to, uh, to share that photo. And um, do you mind just sharing a little bit you shared with me? I know that Tammy um, has a profession as well. You've yep. got the construction businesses. And then uh, Tammy has a profession as well. And just give us a quick update on, on each of the girls. Let us know how they're doing. Yep. Uh, Tammy, my wife, is, a, is an RN. Uh, when we started the business, um, she supported me for a, a number of years. Now that the businesses are going, she's been able to kind of pull back a little bit um, and, and do some do some other things, um, care for her parents. Her parents moved down here about five years ago. They're getting older. She's been able to spend a lot more time with them, which is really nice. Um, Maddie, our oldest daughter, graduated from Mizzou in December of this past year. She started out in fashion and design. That was going to be her career. But uh, after Trevor's passing, Trevor was always kind of being groomed to come into construction. Um, he wanted to go to Iowa State in the construction engineering program. Yes. Kind of followed my footsteps. Um, since his passing, I think it kind of spurred Maddie on a little bit. And Maddie end, ended up uh, switching from fashion and design to civil engineering. And she graduated in civil engineering and is actually now working for Whiting Turner as a project engineer and really, you know, plans on a, on a, on a career in construction. You know, hopefully she'll she'll end up back here in the, in the U.S. companies at some point. But uh, you know, she can go off and do her own thing and and just do what she enjoys. So, um, Ellie, our youngest daughter, will be starting the zoo in the fall. So um, she was really kind of un, unsure what she wanted to do for a while, but uh, now is really kind of starting to focus on um, sociology and mental health and mental awareness. That's uh, incredible. Really, that's a great fun. update. Yeah, kind of following that that career path, and and I think she wants to do, you know, what she can for the industry and for mental health, and and you know, both of them you can just tell by their career paths, you know, are touched by by what happened to their brother. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, thank you again for sharing, kind of that journey uh, to that new normal uh, for each of you and and for your family as a whole. So, Brad, we wanted to provide some grieving and bereavement support uh, resources. One of the things that um, stood out for me was you sharing about your faith and Tammy's faith and how your faith uh, was even strengthened uh, maybe through this overall experience that you couldn't have gotten through this alone. So I think that was one really powerful message. But did you wanna share some additional resources on grieving and bereavement support um, that maybe you want people to know where they could turn for yeah. support in the event uh, that they face suicide or they help someone else um, address uh, suicide survivorship. Sure. Yeah, really, and, and thank you for bringing it up. Um, our our faith throughout this whole thing is really the only thing that is, has helped us get through it. Um, it really is kind of indescribable. It's hard to even put to words, you know, what we've, what we've had to deal with and, and how dramatic our life has been changed. Um, it's the unfortunate thing about suicide is, is it takes, you know, the the person, you know, passing on from suicide thinks that they're, they're helping everybody else out, you know, by, by, you know, by leaving everyone's lives. But I mean, it just, that's the absolute opposite truth. All it is is just shifting, you know, it's just shifting the pain, you know, from one person to another and, and really magnifying it. It's tough for the whole family to deal with, but yeah, church has been very, very important to us um, to get through. And it's also, you know, is relatively easy to get in to, to go talk to a pastor. Um, generally, there's no charge for it. So, you know, a great first step, a great open door, you know, just to call your local church if you're ever having in, any issues and, and talk to the pastor, you know, talk to the associate pastor who, or whomever is there. Um, counselors, therapists, and doctors. I think this is an important, an important piece. Um, I know both our daughters go and talk to a therapist from time to time, which, which to us is great. You know, have someone to kind of open up to and, and talk to. 
Um, it's not always easy to talk to your friends or even talk to your your parents about some of the stuff that you're going through. So um, to know that they have that option out there and, and we really all have that option out there is great. Um, I know seeing a, finding a therapist or finding a counselor is awful tough with all the, the mental health issues um, and really kind of mental health being highlighted now yes. is difficult. I'm really hoping that the industry can can work itself through that, but uh, some some great uh, some great opportunities there. Um, employee assistance programs. Um, you know, talk to you know those those you work with, see if they have any type of of assistance. Um, health and welfare program. Um, this is one that I'm actually working with local 67 here in Des Moines. Uh, we're trying to put together almost like a simple cheat sheet or a simple wallet card on what resources are available uh, for the, the locals, for the, the members of Local 67. A lot of times with, with mental health, there's, there still seems to be kind of a stigma about it. People don't want to reach out and get help and they don't want to have to call the, the local health and welfare office and explain the situation. You know, so we're trying to shortcut that, trying to give them a card that we can, you know, give to them, they can put in their pockets and maybe make a hard hat sticker out of it, but some resources that they can that they can go to immediately that are recognized by their health and welfare plan, you know, and get and get help without having to to reach out and go through a whole bunch of uh, channels. So trying to shortcut the process and, and get them get them the help that they need and make it accessible. Yeah, I commend you for doing that. I think that's a really important step. And it takes uh, the union and signatory contractors working hand in hand, side by side, to help demystify that mental health process. And I think that's a really powerful uh, message. We'll share some resources that Kevin Burns and the Iron Workers have developed, distributed through Impact, two different wallet cards, one for local unions, and then a second one for the contractors. And Brad, I've previously given those two numbers for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and crisis text line. There is a reality that many counties in the United States don't have adequate uh, mental health uh, professionals, psychiatrists. It's like 55% of those counties don't have uh, certified staff. Using these two services can often uh, help bridge that gap. So the work you're doing combined with these two hotlines can be really effective in helping families find uh, uh, counselors in a time of need. So the other thing that we talked about is how the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, AFSP.org, is another really useful uh, resource. And then you shared with me that Maddie was involved in uh, the AFSP at, at Mizzou. You wanna tell us a little bit about uh, your experience with that as well? Sure. The, uh, the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention is really is a great course, um, a great program nationwide. Um, I'd say nearly every single college campus has, a, has an affiliate, has a chapter. Um, and one of the things that they do is sponsor an, art, an out of the darkness walk. Um, they have one here in Des Moines, in Missouri, they have one in Columbia, Missouri. They're all over the country. You know, just a, a, great, a great time for people to get together that have all kind of gone through the same thing. I mean, some of the, some of the people there um, just come in alone, not knowing, you know, not knowing anyone who's who passed away from suicide, just there to help support the cause. There's a lot of families. Uh, we've done it a couple different times. I had t-shirts printed up, you know, with Trevor's name, um, you know, and our daughter, daughter Mizzou, who has kind of headed that the last couple of years, you know, kind of stepped up and really helped organize the Out of the Darkness Walk down in, in, in Mizzou, which is, is really nice as she's getting involved. But um, the other thing that uh, AFSP provides is a lot of resources and a lot of help for people as well. So um, it's not just about remembering those who that are past, you know, it's about essentially trying to help prevent, you know, this from continuing to happen is really their mission. Um, great organization and by all means check out their yes. website. Yes, it's resources. an organization I refer people to all the time. We have a link there for find a local chapter and you can find bereavement resources. Uh, many of the chapters will send a bereavement kit to a family member that's had a recent experience with suicide. They have trained coordinators for a program they call Healing Conversations, and then they have support groups. Some people find help from support groups, others uh, don't. But Brad, you and I both shared a real deep respect 
for the work that AFSP does, and we wanted to highlight them as a really useful uh, place. The other thing that you and I had talked a lot about was the perception that maybe some relationships had been impacted or changed, and maybe it was just that perception, but I think you expressed uh, concerns that people don't always know how to process grief, and they don't know how to approach a survivor of suicide. So over the next couple of minutes, we're gonna talk about this in a couple of different ways. But did you wanna just share a little bit some of the lessons you learned about grieving? And um, they may or may not match perfectly with the seven points that we put on the slide. But I thought maybe there were a few nuggets that you wanted to share. Sure, absolutely, thank you. Um, it's, not, it's not an easy topic to ever discuss with somebody. Um, there's, nothing, there's nothing magical you know, that we've heard there is, that has really made any, anything better. I mean, the, the one thing that we always get is, is, you know, I don't know what to say. You know, I'm so sorry for your loss. I don't know what I can do. You know, I mean, there's the, the simple fact for us, and I think for a lot of people that we've talked to, is just reaching out. We had a number of, a number of friends that I think kind of avoided you know, uh, you know, addressing with it, you know, didn't know what they would, you know, what to say to us. So they just kind of just avoided the subject. And then we had others that went out of their way to reach out to us, um, which is really, really felt good, you know, just to, to be there, you know, to reach out to the families. And I'll give you one, one good example of it. Um, like I said, I coached softball for my youngest daughter for a, a number of years. Um, one of the fathers, uh, Andy, um, after the, you know, the passing of Trevor, you know, he had, he had reached out to me. We had been friends in the past, and we kind of hung out on, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but, you know, in a team atmosphere, we'd, you know, we'd be together and talk and knew each other. But he made a special point to, to, you know, reach out to me, especially early on, at least once a month, you know, go out and grab dinner. In fact, still to this date, we do. Uh, four years later, we just went and had, had dinner about a month ago. But, you know, he takes his time, you know, he's got a professional life, he's got a family, it takes his time to, you know, spend time to me. And I know some, somewhere in the conversation, he'll always ask the same question. And he'll say, Brad, how are you doing? You know, and it just feels, it feels so good, you know, to, to have someone spend time with you and ask you how you're doing that. Uh, I mean, that's the biggest takeaway that I can get from all of this is, is, you know, asking people how they're doing. Yeah, we put a list of uh, tips on the uh, two slides, the one previous and then this slide. Obviously, it's not going to be one size fits all. There's going to be flexibility because people grieve differently. Different approaches might work. But I think really what you were saying is just don't put off acknowledging to the family. Get the awkward moment over so you can go back to having a more normal conversation. It, if you put time and space between it, it becomes harder to bridge that gap. And I think you talked a lot about just being present. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about what you want to say. Don't worry that you're going to say something. Just be there and listen. Uh, that word present came up several times, Brad, in our conversations. And I thought this list uh, was really, really helpful. Drop off a card. Um, it's okay to come to the wake and memorial service. You do want to be uh, together if it's a public service. Don't avoid going. Show support for the family. And uh, just be one uh, in that community to, uh, to stand united uh, with that family. I think the last thing that you and I talked about, it's hard for us. We're always fixers. We're the ones that are always doing things for others. But that last one, when people do acts of kindness, that's frequently a way I let people know. Well, then shovel snow, rake leaves, mow the lawn, just show up and do it. They won't mind. No one's going to be offended if you deliberately take uh, caring action to help show support. And uh, picking up groceries uh, would be another thing that you could do. Bringing a meal and uh, just letting the family know that you care for them. Um, those outward acts uh, go a long way, don't they? Yeah. Some of, some of the things that, that our, our friends and family did for us that we absolutely appreciate um, a neighbor behind us, you know, came up and, and said, I'm going to mow your lawn, you know, until you get through with this, I'll keep mowing your lawn until you, until you're ready to, to do it yourself. And I mean, just small things like that make you, make you feel so good. 
um, a lot of gift cards, you know, for food, a lot of, a lot of dropping off of food, uh, which we definitely appreciated at the time because we had so many people kind of coming and going out of the house. If anyone ever does, does lose anyone, you know, not necessarily because of suicide, but any, any type of passing, um, that's always a, a great show of, of respect and support. So, I mean, it's just the, it's the small things, you know, but just being, being there, reaching out, you know, finding anything that you can kind of do to, just to give the give the family a, a break, give them some relief, and, and help them take care of some things. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying these techniques are beyond suicide. It could be a, a loss of to COVID. It could be just a, a loss by cancer or any other cause. The same uh, strategies for grieving and then support for bereavement would uh, would apply. So that's a really thoughtful uh, point you made, Brad. Thank you. So we wanted to shift and just share some suicide prevention warning signs and resources. So Brad, I really appreciate the fact that you're uh, co-presenting on this part today. Um, but you have had experience talking to people about the suicide prevention hotlines. Do you want to share a little bit about those resources in the U.S.? Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the, the two biggest resources that we have here, there's a suicide uh, prevention lifeline, which is 800 Two two seven three top. Um, if you press one, you'll actually go to the veterans um, side of it, and if you press two, they've got a Spanish version as well. The second one is the crisis text line seven four one seven four one. You know, just reach out, yell, help, connect. But the one thing that I really want to push parents to do um, that, that are out there is to take the time to put these numbers, you know, in your kid's phone. Maybe it's not for them. Maybe it's just so they have it for a friend. But just to, to put these numbers, you know, program them in their phone, because you just, you just never know. Um, I mean, we were completely blindsided by this whole thing. You know, we, you know, I always thought, well, that, that could never, you know, it could never happen to us. But, you know, suicide doesn't have any boundaries. It's, you know, there's no racial boundaries. There's no ethnic boundaries. You know, um, it can happen to anyone. And, and we've heard the same story from talking with people over and over again is, is people are just absolutely blindsided and had absolutely no idea that their, that their child was, was contemplating something like this until it was too late. So um, take the time and put those numbers in their phone. It's a really simple, practical technique, and it's a great way to make sure you have that conversation, you know, with your children. But mm -hmm. it could be with elderly parents as well. Just sharing this information can be a, a lifesaver is what you're saying. Yes. And then on the Canada side, because we've got uh, the international in Canada that's equally concerned about these topics, crisis text line in Canada is the same numbers. So you can text help or connect to 741741 in the U.S. and in Canada. And for Canada, their version of a national hotline is called Crisis Services Canada. That's number 833-456-4566 and um, very powerful life-saving resources that we wanted to share. Now on the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, we wanted to just share high level, some of the micro individual person risk factors associated with suicide. When I did a program last November for impact, we talked about macro industry risk factors. This is actually a photo from a wallet card that's made available from the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And again, because time will be limited, I just want people to know these are here. We'll be continuing the impact series of webinars on mental health, substance misuse, and suicide. And this could be an area that we spend an additional time focused on. But here you have individual warning signs for suicide. And then the more of those warning signs you see, the more essential it is that you help that person make that telephone call for help and stay with that person, help them get through that crisis. And to help them with that crisis phase, we have this five-step process of helping someone who is experiencing emotional pain. It's from the National Institute of Health it's one of the best models that I've seen and one that I refer to people frequently. But it starts with asking if they are in a time of crisis or feeling a lot of emotional pain, 
with a direct question, are you considering self-harm or are you considering suicide? And then keeping that person safe, removing the lethal means and then staying with them, being there, listening, being empathetic. That'll be the key. And then if you can connect them to one of those resource centers that we talked about. And the last part is just staying in touch, maintaining communication, following up. Let that person know, I have your back, I'm here for you, I'm not going anywhere, and uh, just let them know that you're gonna be available to help them through that point of crisis. Brad, on those two items of suicide warning signs or this five-step process, anything that you would like to contribute as well? The uh, biggest thing is on, on the five-step process, just to stay connected. Okay, I'll just like you had said, you know, follow up, you know, don't just, if you think someone's having issues, take the time to ask them how they're doing, follow up a week later, you know, are you better? You know, the, the more the more that you, you reach out and, and show caring for someone, the more they're going to, you know, appreciate it and hopefully open up to you as well if they are having difficulties. Yep, and you talking about it is not going to make someone think about it. It's going to let them know that you're available to give them hope and then to steer them toward help and move them toward a place of recovery. The last area that we wanted to highlight today is that there are many styles of communication. The American Foundation for Suicide Prevention has a program called Talk Saves Lives. There are other programs. QPR is one method of suicide prevention gatekeeper training. That method stands for question, persuade, refer. Very conversational styles. The system that I've really enjoyed teaching in the construction industry is a five-step process used by the University of Washington, and they have a nonprofit called Forefront Suicide Prevention. They have the learn method, and in about a 45-minute session, you can teach people how to have this conversation that's focused around the L, looking for warning signs, E, empathizing and listening, A, asking about suicide, much like I talked about in that five-step crisis plan, and then R, removing the means of suicide. We call that lethal means reduction. And then the N is next steps. Again, we're planting seeds to continue this follow-up workshop. This could be one of the follow-up uh, sessions that we do. And Brad, I know your company is looking at having wallet cards at your next upcoming uh, all-day safety training session. And a couple of the insurance captive program members uh, that you partner with are thinking of doing the same thing. So hats off to you. But one of the tools that you're going to use will be wallet cards for the crisis text line, suicide prevention lifeline, and even this learn model yep. to give people some practical tools. And, and also hard hat stickers. You I know, think that's going to be powerful. We want to try to create as much, as much awareness as, as we can. The more people talk about it and the more regular it becomes, the easier it's going to get for people to, to deal with it. And it's going to be the easier for people to come forward if they are having difficulties. So the more we just keep pushing, you know, pushing the word, make awareness, you know, hard ass stickers, wild cards, training, whatever means you have, the better off we're all going to be. Yeah, that fancy word normalize really means just having conversations to let people know it's okay to not be okay and that help is available. And um, I really give you credit. You're modeling this type of normalizing behavior by sharing so openly as you've done uh, today and as I've gotten acquainted with you. So a couple of things we wanted to do because Trevor was a teenager, we wanted to share some selected resources for families with children. So the resources on this page, they're hot links, they'll be available to you. Prior sessions that uh, Impact has done, they've loaded those resources right on the website. But each one of those might be good insights for families or guardians of uh, youth, uh, whether they're showing signs of risk or not, people who are active in their communities or in their school system will find many of these links, very practical, very useful, share with your school systems, but you'll find uh, very, very important information. That top article comes from uh, Harvard um, and it talks about loneliness during the pandemic. 
our youth are at risk during this time. Prior to the pandemic, suicide was the second leading cause of death for students age 10 to 24. And during the pandemic, one in four youth age 16 to 24 have considered suicide compared to one in nine adults. So anyone who has responsibility for children, whether you're a parent, a grandparent, aunt, uncle, a youth coach, a youth leader, this is an opportunity to really take to heart what Brad has shared about his family's personal journey uh, with respect to, uh, to suicide loss and uh, focus more on the prevention side. Here's where we wanted to give a shout out to, uh, to the iron workers, Kevin Burns. Uh, Kevin Hilton keeps telling us that you're the one who put these uh, two links together. So one for local unions and then one for the signatory contractors. These are on the website now for impact and also the iron workers and they are great resources. They're like tri-fold wallet cards and they're called the crisis strategy plan for suicide. The last item that Brad and I wanted to highlight is that on the impact website, all the prior webinars have been archived. And these are the four through today that have been on these topics. First, starting with Sean Neely, and then that, he did one on uh, addiction. I did one on suicide prevention. Two programs by a company called Teatros, very good programs, highly um, educational. And now today's program, a personal uh, journey in uh, suicide uh, survivorship. And Brad, this will probably conclude our presentation for today. So I wanted to thank you again for opening up, sharing with me. I appreciate you as a new industry friend and on a personal level. Uh, my family has deep admiration for you and uh, me as well. My heart uh, goes out to you and each one of your uh, Churchill family members. Is there anything else that you'd like to share in conclusion with our audience today? Really just wanted to thank you for, for allowing me to to be here today and to, to share about this. And, and thank you very much for, for watching it and, and listening. Um, definitely, definitely appreciate that. Um, again, and I've said it a couple of times, but the biggest, take, the biggest takeaway I want people to, to understand is just reach out to one another, um, talk to one another. Um, the, one of the biggest things that got me through it is, is my, you know, my friendship and I know um, guys typically don't have a lot of really close friends that they can talk, you know, talk, you know, personal things about, but uh, try to create those relationships, at least have the one person out there that you can talk to. Um, if you don't, if you don't have it, you know, clergymen, professionals, you can reach out to them. Um, I also have uh, my email and phone number. I'm at the end of the presentation. Wanted, wanted to share that as well. Um, if you need to reach out, if you have if you have questions, feel free to use me as a resource. Um, I'm by no means a professional, you know. At this, I'm kind of learning learning as we go, but uh, I've got the experience behind me and and can at least possibly help you out. So feel free to reach out to me if you ever need to. But again, uh, thank you, Cal. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Impact, for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, and I'm just going to echo everything you said. Thank you, Impact Iron Workers, for the opportunity to present with you. Like Brad shared, here's my contact info. If I can be of help to you or your company or your local union, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you very much, Kevin and Kevin, for the opportunity to be with you today. Brad, my very best to you, and good luck for a great upcoming uh, construction season. I look forward to seeing you, hopefully in person. Thank you very much. Much. Well, that was certainly uh, extremely powerful. And, and Brad, uh, you know that we all, and, and I do personally express uh, my deepest sympathies for your loss. I know it's never going to go away. And I know earlier I said that uh, we didn't think Chief of Staff Burns would be able to get on because he was traveling, but fortunately he's at uh, his home local union in Connecticut and was able to get on. So thanks for getting on, Kev. Brad, let me ask you a question. Does the pain ease over time? Does it get easier to deal with? It, it, it doesn't. And a lot of people say, oh, just give it a year and you'll feel better. But I really don't think that's the case. We've kind of learned to live with it a little bit and how to deal with it. Um, for myself, I, you know, I tend to keep, try to keep busy. 
Um, I'm more of a one-on-one -on -one type person, you know, so I'll, I'll talk with friends kind of more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. My wife's a lot, a lot better in group settings, you know, so she's still involved in a number of groups um, around the area that, uh, that deal with grieving or, or deal with loss. But uh, um, also, I don't think I'll ever get to the point where I, you know, forget about Trevor. You know, he's, he was a huge part of our life. He still is. You know, so I, I think it'll it'll always be there. Um, I fully expect it to always be there, and you just kind of just learn to learn learn to live with it. I mean, it, it hits you every once in a while. It'll hit you kind of at awkward times. You know, something will just you know press upon your heart. But uh, I mean, that's just that's just how it is, and and I mean, we're uh, just what we have to deal with. Understood. When when he came back to work, if you don't mind me asking. You know, how did you deal with the issue or address the elephant in the room as the, the CEO of your organization? It was, and, and fortunately, I've got a great, I've got an absolutely great staff. Um, most of them were at the, at, the, at the funeral, probably all of them were at the funeral. Um, a lot of them had reached out to me beforehand. Um, but it, it is a little bit awkward meeting, you know, seeing someone, especially, you know, they don't always know what to say. And I know we kind of touched upon that, you know, before, but just reach out. Um, it gets more and more awkward as time goes on. You know, there's never, it's never going to be, it's never going to be easy the first time you, you talk to somebody or, you know, talk to them after it happened, but just reach out to them, you know, to say, Hey, you know, my, you know, our prayers are with you. You know, we feel for you. Is there anything we can do? You know, how are you doing? Just things like that. And, and just break the ice is the, is the biggest thing. Yeah. You know, uh, and we've had a lot of sentiments pouring in, as you can imagine, and many prayers and, and offerings of sympathy during this broadcast. Um, and, uh, and and they continue to pour in. And, and if it's okay with you, I'm going to just read a couple. Um, uh, one says, does anyone know of weekly or monthly meetings comparable to AA to help family members talk about suicide prevention or grieving. Yes, I can I can touch upon that. And depending on the community, um, I know here in Des Moines there's a number of groups. Uh, like there's probably three total that meet on on a monthly basis. So there's and they kind of coordinate them. So usually at least once a week there's a meeting going on in the metro area. Um, again, I would uh, I would reach out to uh, AFSP. You know, and there's some other resources out there. Um, local community centers um, usually have them. Uh, the libraries around here um, do it as well. So there's always people to reach out to. Those groups definitely do exist. Um, also, your church can kind of steer you in the correct direction. A lot of a lot of uh, the churches have resources as well. Yeah, you know, there's something that that I noticed in the midst of this is you did not use the term committed suicide. You said died by suicide. Could you expand on that difference? Because I think we all grew up with the former term. Yeah. And uh, I know for, for some people, you know, committed suicide um, almost makes it seem like it was, it was a choice for, you know, for some people, I just, I just don't think it is. Um, we, we prefer to go by, you know, died from suicide. Um, it's typically how we, how we phrase it. If people ask, you know, what, what happened to Trevor? Um, some people, um, I know, say, you know, took his own life. But, uh, I mean, really kind of a little bit of a softer term than, than committed suicide. Um, it's pretty prevalent from all the people that, that we talk to and deal with. Yeah. Cal, you know, you are a subject matter expert here and, uh, and I think it bears speaking to this that, you know, Kevin Burns were approached by two of our other really fabulous contractors on this very topic and, and asked us what we could do. And, and we've, I think we've evolved, certainly not where we want to be. But Cal, when you shift over to dealing with one of our kind, or, or an organization, uh, whether it's a, an iron worker local union or uh, an employer, you know, what advice do you give in dealing with these extremely difficult topics? Yes, thank you, Kevin. And Kevin, your leadership has been incredible. And before I answer that question, I just want to give my heartfelt thank you to Brad for sharing his story so eloquently and so 
um, just faithfully. It was a remarkable uh, story. I think there's going to be so much good. My phone's been blowing up as people have uh, been sharing the powerful uh, message today. I think the most important thing, despite all these efforts that impact in the iron workers are taking, there are people at risk. There are people who have not been okay for a long time. Whether you're a contractor, whether you're a local leader or a district council, let's find a way to get the safety net out quicker. So let's take urgency. Let's draw a line in the sand and say, let's do today whatever we can do and not let tomorrow pass. If there is someone at risk, let's find a way to reach out. We've been sharing information and resources. I know this, these two Kevins will take a call at any time and they will find people who will help. I think what uh, General President Dean said today regarding the employee assistance program was really clear communication. I think when he said everyone has one or impact has uh, an over uh, site uh, EAP, we have resources, we have tools. So let's all take personal investment in life safety. We wouldn't let an iron worker work without proper fall protection. Let's do the same when it comes to mental well being and, and suicide prevention. And I know that there have been losses since we've started this series, and it pains all of us. But let's all just take that extra step to drive this urgency. Well, and let me, and, and as everybody on here knows, I'm not an iron worker, Kevin Burns is, but I'll go a step further. You know, I've had the good fortune in these past 13 years to work very closely with every level of the Iron Workers Union. And of course, our over 3,000 contractors. There is an army, literally, of people out there that'll take that call anytime, day or night. And uh, the article referred to, it was just a small example of the dedication, you know, when, when a businessman, and I know this from having spoken to them, not firsthand, when a business manager's phone rings, he answers it. And, and I just say he, because they're all men right now, one day that'll change. But, uh, you know, one of the beauties of working in, in my role is I see the very best in, in both organizations and the help they're willing to extend uh, to everybody uh, for based on human dignity issues. Let me ask you one more question, Cal. Um, you know, in today's webinar, there's a focus on safe messaging and why is this so important? Yeah, I think Brad did a really great job communicating why that's important. When we think about normalizing that conversation, we want to break stigma. We want to take away that fear of the unknown and we want it to be safe for people to acknowledge that they're not okay. So we're encouraging help seeking. And I think we've learned it's not enough to encourage help seeking. We have to make it acceptable for people to take or accept help. So safe messaging breaks down the stigma. It does create a safe environment. It allows us to feel that we'll be safe from ridicule or being ashamed. And it lets people know that help is truly available. So we spend a lot of time on that safe messaging, the safe depiction. We wanted to be certain that we didn't do anything that would be harmful. So you notice that uh, content warning. Those were the things that Brad and I talked about. And then the big focus around bereavement and around grief and to let people know that your emotions may be different than others. We highlighted things that were unique to Brad's situation. Most importantly, we didn't want to do anything that would glorify a death by suicide. And so I think Brad uh, was so open, shared his family. Uh, the thing that was really most touching for my family as, as they got acquainted with Brad and, and his family was the two daughters holding the picture of, of Trevor. And um, when I see that, Brad, I got emotional today. And, um, but I think what we've done through safe messaging is let people know we can talk about this. We can talk about it in the workplace. We can talk about it on the job site. We can talk about it in the trailer or when we're commuting back home together and we can be our brothers and sisters keeper. So that's the big part of what Brad and I wanted to accomplish with this message. 
Kevin Burns, let me throw one at you, and it's based on a, a Q&A that came in uh, just a moment ago. Uh, and it mentioned the issue of iron workers advocating. What role do you think that plays in this? And, you know, what message would you want to promote to your brothers and sisters out there? You, you broke up on one of it. Iron workers what? Self-medicating. Okay. Yeah, I mean, as you know, we've had that topic already on uh, opioids and substance use disorder in the construction industry. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, we're, we're trying to give you uh, tools to work with. When you're on a construction site and you're trying to stay sober or when you're, you know, uh, I don't want to get off the topic of what this whole thing was about today, but uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of people out there like Cal, as Cal just said earlier that, uh, you know, there's a lot of signs of people out there that we've seen, you know, functioning alcoholics that you work with people that, you know, just over the years, haven't been hitting on all eight cylinders. Maybe it's time that we, you know, if somebody reaches out to them and says, Hey, come here. I, I, I'm concerned about you. You know, is there anything I could do to help you? Or, you know, or, you know, is everything good at home? Just having that conversation, maybe that will trigger something in that person to say, you know what, I, I am hurting. I, you know, I do need help and, and I am self-medicating and I, I'd like to change, but I, I, don't, I don't know how to do it. So maybe finding a tool to just have that conversation with that person to say, you know, let me try to help you or let, let's, you know, as a friend, I want to, I, it hurts me to see you hurting. That type of thing. So, I mean, uh, staying on the topic of children, like, you know, every iron worker, you know, we, we work to raise a family, right? And if, if your children are suffering at home, then, it, then you're going to come to work with, and you're not going to be in the game type of thing. So I appreciate what Cal, Cal did. And Brad, thank you for sharing your story. What we have to do a better job at too is grief counseling. But, you know, we, like Kevin said, we just had a contractor that lost two iron workers uh, in this in a, a same month, and that contractor really wanted to he heartfelt wanted to help the other employees that really looked up to these two people, and the answer isn't just having the safety steward talk to them on grief counseling. You have to bring in a third party and professional and find those professional ways to help people grieve. Same thing with children. Have that conversation as an iron worker. With, when you go home and say, hey, to your son or your daughter, you know, do you know any of your close friends or high school kids or grade school kids that have ever committed suicide? And 90% of them are going to say, oh, yeah, dad, I, you know, or, oh, yeah, mom. And just to let that person, let that child know that, you know, although that person was in pain, the pain that they left is, is a lifelong thing now, right? Like Brad said, I mean, you, you cope with it the best you can. But there's that. There's always going to be that void of walking by and thinking, "Hey, that's where my son would have been in that room, or my daughter." So having that conversation with your child, that when someone does take their own life, you know they're not in the right place at that right time. But the the pain it leaves the family or your friends and your relatives after that never really goes away. And I'm not saying that's going to stop someone, but maybe that'll make that person think that you know, okay, I do need help or you know, I, I should have talked to you more about it, mom or dad. So just have that conversation as an iron worker parent with your children is what I'm taking away from this webinar. Amen. Kevin, if you don't mind, I'd like to just jump in quickly. In crisis management, we say, and this is not my words, these are the words of a mentor of mine, but he says, at the time of a crisis is not the time to Google crisis counselors. So part of this urgency is really understanding your EAP. Make a call before the fact, not after the fact. Then it's almost too late. It's too hard to execute a proper plan. But let's find ways to keep people um, safe before a crisis. So have that conversation. Check your EAP. Look for um, opportunities through your health uh, benefit program as well or use the crisis text line, see if they can put you in touch with people in your community. With that, um, I would just like to thank you guys. Super powerful, Brad, uh, unbelievable presentation. I know it'll be viewed, it was viewed hundreds of times today. It'll be viewed many times in the future. I believe this was a huge step in creating the culture of caring that 
we all need on, on every aspect of our industry. So thank you very much, Cal and Kevin. As always, appreciate your great professionalism and your dedication to humanity. Uh, you guys take care and everybody uh, stay tuned for future webinars focused on building a culture of caring. Take care and be well. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, sir. Brad. Bye, Kevin. Thank you very much, Brad.